A very warm welcome to the concluding presentation of the Credo Klein Conference. On screen next, we will hear from Ainsley Toe, a firm favorite at many of our previous conferences. Ainsley joined Credo in 2012 and is now head of multi-asset. Ainsley has been tasked with giving us a fresh perspective on the impact of noise in investing and how investors are often fooled by randomness. No small task, but one that we feel as apt for a Friday morning. Please feel free to send us any questions which we will respond to directly. Thanks, Louise. Um, so I've been told that the last time slot on a virtual conference is usually the graveyard shift. Uh, so thanks to everyone for sticking around in front of your screens for, for so long. Um, unfortunately, it is not quite the same as, as, as doing our conferences live like we have in previous years. Um, but one silver lining is that I can share with you some insights which would have been more difficult to do uh, on stage in a conference venue. So today I'm going to talk about noise and um, how successful investing, in my opinion, is learning to live comfortably in a world that one doesn't fully understand. So I'm going to start with a brief trip back to the middle of last century and the work of B.F. Skinner. So Skinner was a behavioral uh, psychologist who's main, uh, most famous for his work on operant conditioning and his experiments with pigeons. Skinner would put pigeons near a device that would give them a reward if they perform a certain act, such as pecking a button. Uh, from his experiments, he, he found he could reinforce a behavior in pigeons by timing the reward correctly. Uh, so this is a short clip of him timing the rewards to get the pigeon to turn 360 degrees. I'm waiting for it to turn <laughs> counterclockwise now. And then I reinforce that movement. And I wait for a more pronounced movement than that. It's got to be more than that. So you can see here the pigeon recognized that turning anti-clockwise would lead to more food. Um, now what's more interesting is that Skinner found when he delivered the rewards randomly, each pigeon would associate the reward with whatever behavior it happened to be exhibiting at that moment. So one would be flapping its wings when it got fed, one would be scraping its head on the ground, one would be turning in circles. Each pigeon had superstitiously done something, randomly been rewarded for it, and then continued to perform that action because it had associated it with the reward. Um, and this is something you can observe in human beings. Uh, we all have our own superstitions and we do things even when there's no rational reason for doing them. Often because at some point earlier in our lives, we saw a pattern uh, that um, wasn't really there and we were fooled into mistaking a signal from something that was random noise. And that's really my core message for you today, that financial asset prices are very noisy. And whilst many investors often take very strong views based on the financial information that they have, most of the time uh, it's quite hard to distinguish whether that information is a true signal or just a product of randomness. So, Let's go back to the beginning of 2020. Uh, with the world locked down, some stocks were set to benefit from everyone staying at home. And, and this is a chart of Zoom, which was already up 1800% in the last week of March as the pandemic set in globally. And a lot of investors very naturally uh, were extrapolating the pattern that they saw in the expectation that the stock would continue rising exponentially with the rising number of COVID cases at the time, uh, especially since there was a natural story they could tell themselves, right? The move to video meetings from face-to-face -face meetings meant more people were going to use Zoom. However, that narrative uh, didn't apply in this case since these investors didn't realize they'd in fact bought the wrong Zoom. Zoom Technologies in Orange is a micro cap company that is involved in um, a number of other technology-related activities, but they don't provide video conferencing. 
Uh, meanwhile, the uh, stop many of them thought they bought, known as Zoom video communications, in blue at the bottom there. Uh, whilst it was still a very uh, an extremely profitable trade, uh, it was far behind the um, the rise of, of Zoom technologies, which left a lot of commentators to rightly proclaim that it's far better to be lucky than smart in investing. Now, um, <laughs> the uh, unfortunately. Being, being lucky isn't a sustainable long-term investment strategy. The run-up in Zoom technologies was so significant that the SEC eventually stepped in and halted the stock. Um, and since resuming trading, it is now actually down for the year. Whereas the Zoom that many of us use for our video calls is now looking like um, it's going to have the last laugh after all. And this, this was uh, an extreme example, but it highlights an important point that investors often myopically focus on short-term performance, since they're usually extrapolating the recent past, even if it's just noise. A, co a more common example will look like this, when uh, an investor is comparing two investments. So the blue line here has, has finished around 60% higher than when it actually started, whilst the red line is almost 40% below where it began. Now I'll ask you, which of these two are you confident is the better investment strategy? And I'll let you ponder that for a moment whilst I switch my screen so I can explain what we're looking at. So hopefully everyone can see these two charts. Um, if I start by focusing on this bottom panel here, this is the long-term performance of the US equity market from 1926 to today. As most investors know, over the long term, investing in the equity market has been a strong source of return, annualizing around 11% a year. Um, compared with the 3% annualized you would have got if you'd left your money in cash over this period. In the big picture, the equity market has pretty much gone from bottom left to top right. Now, moving to the top panel, each of these gray lines are the individual calendar years in the equity market. So zooming in on the different sections of the long-term chart. Um, so if I refer back to our uh, two investments from earlier, you can see that actually they were in fact just the same investment strategy, but two different years that you would have experienced whilst holding this investment strategy, what, which was the US equity market. The blue line here was 1933 which if we go down, you can see in the bottom left there, uh, what may seem like a very long period during the year is actually very, very short in the grand scheme of things. And the bottom red line, which we were comparing it to was the year 2008, which is just down over here when the market fell almost 40%. So you can see from all these lines that even though your investment process, the way you were investing was exactly the same every year, the short term experiences vary dramatically, even if it was very profitable over the long term. Uh, and this is not because you are changing your strategy every year, but just due to the noise in the market. So one way to interpret this is that the equity risk premium or the long term reward to bearing the risk of holding equities is the average of this very long term chart, which has been around 11%, as I mentioned. With all these lines at the top representing the noise around that average. Now, the, um, the problem is that in equities, the noise dwarfs the signal. And anchoring to this long-term average number uh, can lead to the wrong short-term expectations. Uh, this chart is plotting all of the individual year's returns that's the blue dots uh, with 1933 at the top, the top left here, and 2008 in the bottom right. The gray area shows the long-term average that I mentioned, the 11%, but with a 1% range around it. So anything between 10 and 12% is in this gray area. And what you'll notice is that, admittedly, is a very small range, but there is only five out of 95 years in the whole of the um, history that we have here are close one, within 1% 1 of that long-term average. 
even if we expand the average, uh, expand the, the gray box to be 10% around that long-term average, so between zero and 20, um, what you'll see here is that on the right, this is the count of the number of points in our range. So even within 10% of the average, we're getting less, uh, just over a third of all of the data points, right? Um, in fact, you can go even further and expand this from between plus 20 and minus 20%. And the key thing is this count on the right, which shows that you're still only capturing half of the data. What, what, what I'm saying is that uh, if you take an equity investor, the number of years they experienced making more than 20% and less than minus 20%, still just only um, half the years and about the same as the number of years as an investor would experience between plus and minus 20. There is about as many blue dots here as there are orange dots. This highlights the problem with using point estimates such as averages when the market is dominated by noise. The vast majority of the time, you dramatically overshoot or undershoot the average. This is why they say um, if an economist uh, got their head in the oven and their feet in the freezer, um, they would say that on average, they're comfortable. Uh, or it would be like saying um, that an average human being has one breast and one testicle. So going back to our, um, switching back to our slides now. So we've seen how noisy one year periods can be and how over the very long term, we can observe uh, an average where the noise can cancel itself out. But most investors don't allocate their money on a 100 year time horizon. Uh, and even over multiple years, the noise can accumulate. So if you're me measuring an average over a specific time period, the number you get can be extremely sensitive to the start and the end points that you've chosen. For example, in the 1970s, we saw an extended period of rampant inflation and very weak equity market performance, um, with equity investors actually underperforming an investment in cash over those 10 years, as you can see in this chart, with equities in blue and cash in black. And this led many commentators, uh, such as those writing for Business Week magazine, to proclaim that it was the death of equities in the summer of 1979. And this seems to be a uh, unique feature of our somewhat fragile industry in which uh, all it takes is to, uh, to be declared deceased, is to lose a few coin tosses in a row. Uh, of course, three years on from the publication of the issue of uh, that issue of Business Week, the market had not experienced as much negative noise. And it had gone on to double by May of 1983, outperforming cash by about 7% annualized, which, funnily enough, is quite close its long-term average outperformance, which inevitably led the magazine to then claim that it was the rebirth of equities. And my point here is that given the amount of noise in financial asset prices, when you're measuring a cumulative performance, you can paint any picture you want just by moving your start and end points around. And remembering uh, B.F. Skinner's superstitious pigeons, uh, an investor's views on the market quite often depend on what strategies happened to be rewarded uh, during their formative years in the market. It, there's a fine line between gaining insight from data uh, and seeing things that don't exist. Um, but when you're looking at this amount of noise, really uh, taking strong views in either direction are, are, are often um, unwise. Um, when there's such a high likelihood that they're going to be based on the noise um, or just how you've chosen your starting points. Now, one thing to consider when analyzing a fixed time period is to ask how representative is the period that you've chosen? This is particularly relevant for value investing. So this chart shows the average annual returns over the last 70 years of cheap stocks defined as the cheapest third of the market by price earnings ratio and that's in blue on the right and comparing that to expensive stocks which is the third of the market with the highest p ratios um, and this is from 1951 up until the last 10 years and as most of you know over the long term cheap stocks outperform expensive stocks 
the blue bar is higher than the orange bar. But what I show here in the dashed columns are the experience of those exact same strategies, but over the last 10 years. And again, as most of you will know, uh, whilst cheap stocks have not performed badly on an absolute basis, so that dark blue line on the right with the dashboard around it, and over the last 10 years, cheap stocks have been slightly worse than their um, longer term average, but, but still quite uh, respectable sort of performance. Um, on a relative basis, compared to the most expensive stocks, um, they've lagged significantly because the expensive stocks have put up stellar returns in the last 10 years. As the, or, um, the red bar there, um, you can see is around 70%, which is way higher than um, you would have expected given their long-term performance. So really, um, and I haven't, I haven't shown it on this chart, but maybe it's, maybe it's an interesting aside, and that's that these only include stocks with positive earnings, where you can actually measure the PE ratio. If you look at stocks with negative earnings, um, they've actually done even better than the expensive stocks there in red in the last 10 years, which may be a sign of the times that we're living in. So here what I'm showing is uh, uh, giving you giving you a, a feel for whether 10 years is actually a, a long time or not. Right, in, in A decade may seem intuitively uh, like a long period of time to us, but is it representative in this case? And, and these are the actual P ratios on this chart of the two strategies that we were talking about, the expensive stocks on the top and the cheap stocks on the bottom, with the dashed parts of each line highlighting the last 10 years. And you can see that uh, our arbitrary choice of a decade captures a period during which expensive stocks have re-rated upwards significantly and gotten much more expensive. Um, so their prices have risen faster than the fundamentals, um, and that's provided a significant tailwind to their return. And the gap in valuation between the cheap and the expensive stocks has widened almost to where they were at the peak of the tech bubble in 2000. So does the relative performance of value stocks in the last 10 years tell us that something's changed for the strategy? Or is it driven by noise and our choice of measurement period here? So something else to consider is uh, when you're thinking about noise is incorporate, incorporating uncertainty into your investment process. The problem is it's often much easier to communicate what you think than to describe how certain you are in your view. So this is a visualization of data from the CIA on how NATO military officers interpreted different verbal expressions of uncertainty. The officers were given various statements, as you can see there on the left, um, and they were asked to assign percentage probabilities associated with each of those statements. So assuming, uh, and it's assuming that they read the statements in an intelligence report. The curves are the probability distributions um, that the officers assigned to each statement. So it's based on the percentages at the bottom. For example, about even, which is right in the middle there, uh, in, in terms of the number of statements, is dead on 50%. And that means that all the officers who agreed, it must, uh, that phrase, about even, means a 50-50 chance of happening. Now, the striking thing is that they all generally show, all these statements show a lot more variance um, than one would hope for from military officers where an accurate communication of uncertainty could mean the difference between peace and a military conflict. And I know this exact phrase isn't, isn't in this chart, but perhaps this lack of agreement on perceptions of probability might shed some light on the US invasion of Iraq when the CIA allegedly said to the White House that it was a slam dunk that Saddam Hussein um, had weapons of mass destruction. So perhaps the level of certainty that the phrase slam dunk implied was lost in translation in that instance. Now, whilst measuring and adjusting your views for uncertainty can be unnatural to many of us, this is a cornerstone of the scientific method. 
for those of you who read uh, who, who read academic journals or can remember your secondary school science classes, testing a hypothesis involved directly accounting for noise through the requirement of statistical significance. So the significance level you choose is the amount of certainty you want that your finding was not just due to random noise. So uh, just a quick refresher uh, here for, for those of you who've forgotten and using a simplified example. You measure the return of investment and it's positive, but you want to know if this is due to noise or not. So you take the risk adjusted return or a measure of it, such as the Sharpe ratio, which is basically dividing the return by the volatility of that return. Then you scale this risk adjusted return by the amount of data you have or the time over which you measure the Sharpe ratio. Uh, and this gives you uh, a measure of statistical significance, which you can quite easily compare to the level of confidence you require that the strategy is not just noise. So if you compare it to the most common level, which is 5% significance, that means that even accounting for the noise, you can be 95% confident that your strategy has a positive expected return. And hopefully this makes intuitive sense uh, for how the behavior of an investment strategy is linked to statistical significance. You want a high return, that means you'd have a higher risk adjusted return, that means you'd have more statistical significance. If you've got higher risk or your return is noisier, uh, it means you'd have lower risk adjusted return, which means you'd have less statistical significance. And if you have more data, that means you'd have more statistical significance. However, this still means that if you tested 100 investments that were all random noise, you would still find five which were positive and statistically significant just by chance. And in reality, given the uh, potential profits of finding a significant investment strategy, the field of finance, in the field of finance, we have tested far more than 100 of them over the years. So this is a graph of the number of investment strategies with statistically significant outperformance that have been documented in the academic literature. And this has steadily increased at around 15 to 30 new discoveries a year uh, when last counted on this graph. Uh, and it's since increased to beyond 400 uh, in total. Now, given what we know about how traditional statistical significance works, this might be raising alarm bells for many of you. Um, but let's walk through this comic to highlight why this is problematic. Suppose you want to test whether jelly beans cause acne. So a scientist would perform the experiment uh, and come back with, with the result. <clears throat> In this case, he found that it didn't cause acne at the 5% significance level. So the results were not statistically significant but 95% confidence. And that is what that p-value above 5% means. However, say you now want to extend the experiment to test jelly beans of different colors. Um, so you test uh, purple jelly beans, brown jelly beans, pink and blue and teal, all with no success. So then you keep going uh, and you find no success with salmon, or red, or turquoise, magenta, or yellow jelly beans. And you test all of the colors under the sun. And in doing so, you happen to find that green jelly beans tested successfully as being linked with acne. So you then go and publish that finding, which some journalist notices, and the next day in the newspaper, <clears throat> the headline is that green jelly beans are linked to acne. And there is a 95% confidence in the results, and there's only 5% chance that it was a coincidence. And this is the problem of multiple testing, that there's a silent majority of results that were not reported. Um, and that's all of those colors of jelly beans that you tested but came up with no relationship. Because you tested 100 colors, you'd find five positive results just by chance. Now, many finance academics and even more asset managers are incentivized to find positive results and to test until they find what works, either so they can publish their findings or so they can market their strategy to unwitting investors who blindly take the results at face value and assume that past performance 
uh, as representative of the future, when really it's often just noise. So going back to finance, a paper published earlier this year in the Review of Financial Studies looked at all of these statistically significant strategies in the literature. And after making an adjustment to the level of statistical significance for the fact that multiple tests had been performed, and they did some other things, like they removed some other biases from the effect of small cap, uh, micro cap stocks, I should say, which weren't tradable. What they found was that 452 anomalies they tested, of those 370 were no longer statistically significant. That is 80% failed to replicate, which goes to show that given enough noise, even honest academics can be as superstitious as pigeons if they're given the right rewards. So a lot of the issues with noise I've mentioned today are to do with investors being too short term in the face of uh, noisy financial markets. Uh, when the long term data suggests that holding the equity uh, risk is rewarded despite the short term noise. And I want to finish by turning this on its head. Can it be possible that not being short term enough can also lead to the wrong conclusions about financial markets? Can being too slow in your measurement frequency lead you to miss important information happening in between the times that you look? Uh, and I'm referring here to the wagon wheel effect. This is the optical illusion that when you're watching a film uh, where the car wheels appear to be rotating backwards slowly, even when the car in the movie is going forwards. Uh, you're being tricked because the frame rate at which the camera is capturing the wheels uh, moving uh, is uh, fooling your, 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 your brain. Now, uh, this, this, this is what, another example of the uh, wagon wheel effect. Um, in this video, the frame rate of the camera just happens to match the rotation of the helicopter rotor. So, so to us, it all appears that the rotor isn't moving. So this is um, daily data on uh, an investment in the US market between 1993 and today. And for every $1 invested, you would have got back about $7.13 over this period. This daily data is measured at fixed points in time. And as with most financial time series, these are returns measured with closing prices. So prices at the close of the market. So each data point, each daily uh, return that you have, is assuming that you held the investment from 4 p.m. New York time on one day to 4 p.m. New York time on the next day. Well, what if we compared that buy and hold strategy to two others, one which only invests during trading hours between 9.30 and 4 o'clock in black there, and we compare it to another one which only invests overnight, that is between 4 p.m. and 9.30 a.m. on the next morning. And if you do that, what you find is that when you de decompose the return between overnight and during trading hours, every $1 which was invested only during the overnight period, that's in blue there, would have $7.46 today if you invested $1 in 1993. Whilst if you invested $1 only during regular trading hours, you'd only have 96 cents today. That's to say more than 100% of the equity return has been accumulated overnight. And much to the disappointment of the day trading community, uh, though the market is up six times over this 30 year period, uh, if you only invested during normal trading hours, uh, since 1993, you would have actually lost money. Uh, now, if the equity risk premium truly existed, that is if an investor who bears the risk of holding equities over time is rewarded for that risk, then why are the blue and the black lines so different? Because in that world, it shouldn't matter what time of day you're bearing that risk and the noise can't possibly account for this gap over 30 years. 
which suggests that something else is probably going on. And this is one of many open questions in finance still to be answered. However, if the most academically robust and most widely held belief in investing, the equity risk premium, um, does turn out to be a misconception, then you do have to wonder whether we as the investment community are all just superstitious pigeons spinning around all day, getting fed rewards at random. And I'll leave you with everyone's favorite slide from compliance and finish with uh, one of my favorite quotes, which is that um, when it comes to doing investment research, knowledge is cheap, but curiosity is priceless. Thanks. Angeli, many thanks once again for a really fascinating presentation. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Roy Etlinger, the founder, ex-CEO, and now chairman of Credo Wealth. I've been given the privilege of making the closing comments at this, our first virtual conference. And thus, will only take another two minutes of your time. Angeli started his presentation by suggesting that he had the graveyard shift. Well, I'm not sure what the shift after the graveyard shift is called, but perhaps an appropriate term would be the wake. I know that after the last, over the last nine months, you've all spent many more hours than you could have ever envisaged in front of your screen. Zoom calls, Teams meetings, Skype calls, webinars, or, a ho or on any one of the other myriad of communication tools that are bound today. I really want to thank you all for giving up some of your valuable time to listen to what Credo has to say. And as importantly, for those of you who are clients to have entrusted ourselves to look after yours and in many instances, your clients' investments. Yesterday, we were treated to two very stimulating presentations. Today, we had another two, also stimulating and fascinating. And I really hope that you found all four as informative as I did. Whilst we really hope that you enjoyed this virtual conference, I for one can't wait until the new normal allows us to present in, fle in the flesh and then to be able to meet, have a drink and catch up afterwards. All that remains is for me to thank all of my colleagues, the presenters who made this possible. Louise, Alan, Charles, Dion, Richard, Jared and Ainsley. However, in addition to them, there are two unseen and unsung heroes who ensured that the filming was pretty flawless, and that's Natalie and Lucas. Thanks, guys. Finally, I also want to be able to say that I'm absolutely delighted to be handing over the chief executive role to a long-standing credo colleague of mine, Charles van der Merwe. I can assure you that Charles will ensure that the credo culture of making sure that you, the client, remain the focus and the priority will be maintained. Until the next time, stay well, stay safe, and stay in touch. And please remember the credo investment philosophy, which is to stay invested. Thanks for listening and enjoy your afternoon.